Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 19th of October 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That is mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is Dungeon Defenders, which is out right now, and quite frankly, you should buy it. Before I start, I want to address the whole Orcs Must Die versus Dungeon Defenders thing. Which should I buy if I only have enough money for one of them? Because they both cost about the same. In my opinion, if you want to focus on single player, you should buy Orcs Must Die. Because it has a superior single player experience to Dungeon Defenders. That's because Dungeon Defenders was obviously designed with co-op in mind. So if you're looking for a multiplayer experience, then you get Dungeon Defenders. Both are extremely good games, both are not the same, there's no real doubt about that, and both have a lot to offer, so give it a try one way or the other. But that would be my distinction between the two. First email comes in from DOSP5. It says the new focus of complaints on the League of Legends forum is skin distribution. The complaint is that characters like Annie and Teemo have lots of skins, but characters like Urgot and Trundle only have two. However, I feel like it's worth pointing out that Teemo and Annie have skins that are nothing more than different colour versions of the original. Teemo has only two skins worth buying, Astronaut and Easter Bunny. Trundle skin seems quite good, or at least it's not just a goth version of the default. What are your thoughts on the matter? Well, for one thing, you're wrong, because Teemo has Badger Teemo, which is best Teemo, and there is also a Super Teemo, which is pretty good, but Badger Teemo is unquestionably and scientifically best Teemo. And in order to demonstrate that, I provided you this pie chart right here that very clearly shows that Badger Teemo is best Teemo. I think there's a couple of things to consider when you uh, think about making skins for LOL and their business model. One, they're going to make skins for a character that's not really being played all that much, because they can't make any money off of that. You make a skin for Urgot, and you've got to ask, well, why? Because Urgot is an extremely rare champion. He's not played all that much at all. It's probably because he's not all that great. I mean, he's got scaling issues. He was terrible when they first started. I mean, pretty much that character was dead on arrival after level 5. Trundle is certainly a more popular character, but nowhere near as popular as, say, Annie or Teemo. I mean, Annie's an incredibly popular character. That's why you've got a lot of skins for it. You've also got to bear in mind that Annie's been around for a while. So Annie gets a lot more skins simply by the fact that she's had more time for Riot to develop skins for her. I think that that's one of the reasons. The other reason is a creativity issue, I think, and it comes down to, well, what other skins do you make for characters like Urgot or Maokai, for instance? What, what can you do there? It's very, very easy to come up with a new skin for a humanoid character or an animal character, say, you know, Annie or Teemo, prime examples there. Not so easy to come up with skins for some of the more unusual heroes. Skarna, for instance, is a good example. I think Zereth as well. And then, of course, Urgot, as you mentioned right there. I think there's a lot more room for some Trundle skins, certainly, but you did point out that those skins are very good, and they are very, very good. The Trundle skins are both excellent. So it is the possibility that think, well, that's enough skins for this guy for the time being. We're going to work on somebody else. I think it really comes down to whimsy, though. It's what Riot decides they want to create and what their art department thinks is the best. And there is a little bit of marketing involved in there as well. They think, well, which characters are being used the most now? Well, here's some extra skins. I mean, Vayne came out not so long ago, and Vayne ended up with an extra skin quite soon after release because of course Vayne was a fairly popular character. Caitlyn hasn't been out for all that long relative to other characters and she's got a bunch of extra skins because she is a very, very popular champion. As a result, people see Caitlyn doing really, really well on bottom lane, as she tends to, and they buy Caitlyn, and then, of course, they want to buy a skin for Caitlyn. So from a business perspective, you can see why that would be the case. This one comes in from Andrew that says, My question is, what is your opinion on games customization options at the moment? Most people, as far as I can tell, love the amount of options that games have. Just look at Call of Duty, for example. No two people will have the same setup in one game. Not true. <laughs> anyway, continue. In my opinion, this is making games more and more unbalanced. Games are becoming less about the skilled players being the best, but what players will find that one good setup that beats everyone? One really good example I can think of personally is the change from Gears of War to Gears of War 3. In the first game, when you spawned, everyone had the same weapons. The only thing that put you ahead of another player was skill. Now in Gears 3, you can choose from a selection of weapons to spawn with, some giving you an advantage over other players in specific situations. I don't think a game should be decided on how good a gun is. I feel it should be how good you are with the gun. But these are just my thoughts on that. I would like to hear yours. Well, it depends on the game. You can't apply universal constant to everything. I mean, for one thing, you're wrong about Call of Duty. Loads of people use the same setup. Sure, they might use a different camo paint, or they might use a different dog tag, but they're going to be using the same guns. I mean, Black Ops, for the longest time, and this is probably still the case. I haven't played it in a while, so I don't know what the metagame's like. 
you had 80% of people using the FAMAS or the AK-74U or the AUG. Chances are if you took the AK-74U, you'd also take the Warlord perk so that you could get grip and rapid fire. And that was a metagame for a huge amount of people. And as a result, most people used that setup. There are a few people that use different things, but those three guns were dominant. I don't know if they still are, but they certainly were for the first four to five or six even months of launch. No real doubt about that. I don't think it really does come down to just how skilled you are. I mean, we're not talking about Instagear Braille Arena here. You know, not everyone has the same weapon because while there is a place for that kind of game, that's a highly competitive game that a lot of people don't really get a huge amount out of. Let's give everyone the same gun and see what happens there. There are games that do that really well. Same deal as, say, Trackmania. Every car is the same in Trackmania, or at least in Trackmania 2 it is. Don't really know how the original game worked. In Trackmania 2, you've all got the same vehicle. And you can customize it a little bit in terms of looks, but you can't customize it in terms of any kind of performance and things like that. That's successful, you know, that's a good model. But then you've got other games that kind of rely on that customization element in order to give them a little bit more depth, because otherwise they would be fairly dull. And I think Call of Duty, with everyone spawning with the same weapons, would be fairly dull, honestly. The variety and the disparity within the weapons is what actually adds a lot of color to the game. There are also other games, shooters, for example, Battlefield 3 or any of the Battlefield games, where it really is essential for that kind of customization to come into play, because you shouldn't simply be able to beat everything with a single weapon. If someone is in a tank, you can't shoot it with a pistol. Doesn't matter how good you are with that pistol, you're still not going to do any damage to it. And that's where variety and depth comes into the game, and that's where teamwork is kind of forced. Because someone's going to have a rocket launcher, otherwise that tank is going to roll over everything. Or someone's going to have C4, or whatever the case. So, I think that those customization options are required in a lot of games. I think that perhaps they have gotten to the point where every game needs to have some kind of leveling up progression based metagame in order for it to succeed. I don't really necessarily agree with that. I think that artificially extends the lifespan of a game because people just want to keep pursuing these imaginary points or whatever. They want to get badges, they want to get medals, they want to get 10th prestige, they want to unlock this, they want to unlock that. That level of customization and the unlocking and the progression in that customization adds a lot of longevity to the game. I don't necessarily think that that's the best way to do it. I think it's a bit of false longevity there, and people are really perhaps driven by their needs to get badges as opposed to their need to do anything else. I mean, World of Warcraft is a prime example of people's desire and willingness to get achievements and badges by doing mundane tasks. And I think that that masks a lot of the mundane nature of some modern multiplayer titles. Aside from that though, I think that it is fairly reasonable and there are some games where a uniformity and a balance between the different players simply by them all having the same abilities is a good idea and there are some games where it clearly is not. This one comes in from Brian J that says, Today I picked up a copy of Batman Arkham City and found something interesting in my box. As I was waiting for the day one patch to install, I decided to read through the manual for the game and see what it had to say. When I opened up what I thought was a manual, it turned out to be a brochure for Batman products. I was at first confused and looked to see if I had missed something, but I had not. After some looking online, apparently I'm not the only one that did not get one. While I'm fine with just looking at the settings screen in game to learn the key configuration and the basics of gameplay from the intro tutorial, I find that the lack of manual and inclusion of ad space is interesting. Obviously the budget for making the manual was it turned into an ad for merchandise for the game. I was wondering what your feelings are on this and how the continued reduction of game manuals and other titles affects the community. Well, I don't really think it affects the community, because the kind of people that we want to be reading game manuals are not reading game manuals. They weren't doing so before, they're certainly not doing so now. The kind of people we want to be reading these things are the idiots that cause problems, and they're not going to read a manual. Come on! You know, these are the same guys that won't willingly go and look up a build for a champion. They just ran them into it and pick some stupid thing and say, oh, you know, it's, it's my right to play this game the way I would have played. Let's ignore the fact that I'm ruining the fun of four other people on my team or whatever. The yeah, same problem of once again applies to WoW and a bunch of other team-based games. Manuals are really something that has sadly fallen by the wayside, and there is no doubt that I disagree with it. I do not like the lack of effort that is going into box games at the moment. 
it's almost as if they don't really want to sell games in boxes anymore. They prefer to do it all digitally, and I can't really blame them for that, but this move over to digital is annoying to me because I'm seeing that a lot of games are still costing exactly the same amount of money regardless. I mean, digital cuts out a lot of stuff. It cuts out the distributor. It cuts out the fact that potentially you've got lost profits due to the shortage of a particular title or whatever. It cuts out the possibility of theft, for instance, if somebody hijacks a truck. I know it's unlikely, but it's another problem that can be removed from the supply chain. It saves money. It's as simple as that, and yet those savings are not passed on to us. Once again, manuals. Have those savings been passed on to us, the removal of manuals? No, they haven't. They really haven't. And while the cost of games has not skyrocketed, there's no real doubt, anyone who says that they have is is BS. It's, it's just not the case. Just go and look at, if you happen to have any of these, look at an old magazine. Look at an advertisement, especially around, say, Christmas, for instance, for SNES games. Loads of SNES games were as expensive, if not more expensive, than games are right now. However, the amount of stuff that's being cut out of current titles I think is unreasonable. The removal of the manual does kind of suck for a number of different reasons. Buying a game back in the day was buying a product. It's like you felt like you owned it because you had a book with it, you maybe had a nice box and things like that. You felt like you bought something that you wanted to treasure. When it comes to the boxes of games right now, God, I have my CDs in a pile on a spindle and my boxes are on the shelf. I mean, I don't care. I'd actually prefer that there weren't any boxes anymore because they take up space. Boxes used to have cool things like manuals. I still have my Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri manual. As well as having a ton of useful information, it also had a lot of lore about the game. So I read through that manual. It took me a while to do so. I didn't just sit down there and read it or whatever and go from cover to cover. But I did read it over the course of a certain amount of time. And I found out a lot of cool stuff about that game and its universe, which helped immerse me in the title. I don't know if a lot of people really feel the same way about manuals. Manuals did used to have a lot of good tips, they used to have a lot of good information, advanced concepts. That stuff sort of introduced to you piecemeal these days. And while I do agree that tutorials are required and they are a good way to get you into the game faster, I don't think that's an excuse for removing the manual entirely. Hell, I would just be happy to have, say, a 10-page book with a bunch of lore about the game in it. That would be good. I would be all right with that. I don't even need any instructions in the book. Just a little companion guide that fleshes out the universe just a little bit so that maybe I can read it while, as you said, it's installing a day one patch or certainly on PC. I can just read it while it's installing at all. So that's something I would like to see, but it's unfortunate, sadly, that they've decided that that's something that needs to be cut out in order to save money. Problem is, we're not seeing any of that those savings go on to the company, we don't benefit. Sad face. Good luck convincing a company that it's required, though, <laughs> because really a lot of the arguments I've just given are very subjective. They're almost nostalgic in a way. It's difficult to justify to a company why they should be including manuals with their boxes, because I'm sorry, I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to stop buying games just because they don't have manuals. It kind of disappoints me that they don't have them, but it's not a major enough issue for me to start screaming boycott or whatever. It's just not that important. There are a lot of other things I think that need to be focused on that do not involve whether or not I want to sit down and read a manual in my off time or whatever. All right, folks, that's been done for the day. My name has been Total Biscuit, and I will see you next time.